Um, today I'll continue our series on the Book of Acts. And it's been such a joy really to go through the Book of Acts together as a family because it is the story of the first church family in the Bible. And we see all that takes place after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. And it follows through the lives of the disciples of Jesus and we really get to see their faith in action. And all the things they learned while they were to be Jesus are put to test. And we see all of that throughout the book. So I think it's really a powerful book and it's been an interesting time preparing for this because um, there's so many things in there to pull out of it. But we're gonna focus a little bit this morning about how the disciples were able to live for Jesus and in some cases die for Jesus. And the Holy Spirit really is the reason. And in previous weeks we've looked a lot around the Holy Spirit and its power throughout the early church. You know, he's our promised leader, he's our teacher, he's our guide, he's our comfort and peace. He's our everything when we want to live for Jesus in this ever broken world that we find ourselves in. Like the disciples, we also receive power when the Holy Spirit comes in us. And the Holy Spirit seals our faith and takes us on that faith journey. And with the disciples, we receive power to receive the Holy Spirit himself. Or we receive power to preach the gospel, power to withstand trials and temptations and opposition. Faith to perform miracles and faith to gather fellowship and grow. So the book of Acts really is a real template of what our journey of faith should look like. And there's plenty for us to for us to learn. So the story we're going to look at this morning follows the report um, of the spread of the gospel to a town called Antioch, which is modern day South Central Turkey, including Antakya. This is where the disciples were first called Christians. So let's bear this in mind when we read the first part of the text. So we're going to be in Acts chapter twelve. Verses 1 to 19. I'm going to start off just with the first there. So verses 1 to 4 says, It was about that time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this meant the approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, they put him in prison, handed him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring out to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So we're just gonna pause there for a minute. And here we see that the spread of the gospel and the affirmation of the disciples as Christians is being met with death and persecution. This did not happen because they become, before they became Christian, it happened after they became Christians. So we can be sure that when we choose a life of faith, a life of following Jesus, this could be met with the same response. Have many of us gone for promotions before? You know, it all seems very appealing, doesn't it? The pay rise, um, even more holiday allowance sometimes, a bit more flexibility, hybrid working, and maybe even a new title. But it doesn't take very long into the role that we get extra responsibilities and we realize that suddenly we're fighting battles between the upper management and now our junior colleagues. And this can soon become very overwhelming without the same degree of praise and recognition. Our Christian lives are not a rise to fame. We have never been promised comfort. In fact, Jesus was very clear that if we follow him, we will face the same trials and challenges that he faced. So we can afford to be so optimistic about Christianity that we forget that it is a tough walk to, to run and follow. And this can be really hard to teach because really it's a bad business plan. Can you imagine if our church post to read, Welcome to Emmanuel, we can find pain, trials, and conflict, and difficult times ahead. Apart from those too curious for their own good, really. <laughs> and most of us will run away from it. I think presence peace and flourish. 
has a better ring to it. We would like to take credit for this, but really it is firmly based on what we feel God has called us to as a church family. And this is a truth that really sits hand in hand with the fact that Jesus says that the world will hate us. As human beings, we quickly get comfortable with the things that satisfy us. Food, water, clothes, homes, jobs, money, cars, and so many more. And these are all good things, and they are gifts from our God and our Father in heaven. However, they can quickly become sources of security and identity. It is the biggest thing that comfort may lead to. The biggest thing that comfort leads to, I think, is a sense of entitlement and after that disappointment. Because when God provides us with a car, for instance, we're grateful and we're happy, but very quickly we begin to enjoy driving places that we soon forget how long we have to wait at the bus stop. We forget how early we have to wake up to get prepared and sometimes we, have to, we forget that we have to say no to activities with friends just because of how long it will take to get there and back. So maybe two years down the line, we might even start thinking of the next car. We want to, you know, get something a little bit more fancy, a little bit more steady on the road. A car that doesn't break down. But then this one does, and it has to be scrapped. Then we mourn and we grumble about how could this happen to us, and what an inconvenience it is. All the while forgetting that it wasn't our right in the first place for the gift. Before long, we get frustrated and disappointed in God for allowing this to happen to us, for not paying too much attention to our comfort in the car, for not even one waiting for us to, you know, save up enough to get the next one. And don't get me wrong, having a car is such a gift, and this is one I really rely on mine, so. Um, but we can see here how the car, as well as many other comforts that we have, can soon feel like our rights as Christians. We feel it's our right to have a good job, our right to not be sick, our right to be healed, to get married, to have children, buy houses, and so on. This sense of entitlement, when unsatisfied, can make the heart sick. It can make us sick with despair, with hopelessness, doubt, and sadly, it can lead to very dark places in our walk with Jesus. We still find ourselves in positions where we start giving God ultimatums. Like, if you don't do this, I might give up my faith. How quickly we forget that it is only by grace we have been saved, not because of our works, so that none of us can boast. The moment we get comfortable and at ease, we are more likely to complain and grumble when those comforts disappear. And this is why we teach on trials. We teach on it so that we can keep our hearts soft and in complete submission to God. We also teach on trials because it refines and transforms us. John Edberg writes that if you ask people who don't believe in God why they don't, the number one reason you will find is suffering. But if you ask people who believe in God when they grew most spiritually, the number one reason will also be suffering. And so it is clear that the enemy will use our greatest growth catalyst to draw us far away from God. Let us consider for a moment to see if you've got green fingers. I'm sure you've been in the garden a little bit, this, this small summer we've had. Um, but if you imagine that you have a seed and you place it on a pillow under your bed, and you stroke it every night, you take good care of it, in five months' time you come and you might find that that seed is completely died, or it might remain intact and nothing has happened to it. Or if you place it in the soil, it is battered and it is broken down, and in essence it dies in order for it to grow and produce fruit. As part of that process, a good gardener might actually not put the seed straight away in the ground because the conditions might be too harsh for it. First they put in a little tray inside, in the soil just so that it can grow and have a chance to germinate and then they transfer it into deeper soil and harsher conditions with the assurance that it will build stronger roots to withstand those conditions. The same happens in our Christian faith. 
we have to be buried to grow. Trials and challenges and suffering form those harsh conditions for which our faith is tested and tried. It is in those conditions that we rely on the gardener, our good father, and we develop strong roots, and so we can therefore have good and abundant fruits. Jesus tells us that he is the vine and his father is the farmer. We can rely on Jesus even in the moments when we don't understand the challenges. We can face it with him, with us, as he refines us and prunes us and makes us ready to grow even more fruits. And this can be really hard to get our head around, especially if we find ourselves even in this moment, in the middle of life, challenges and trials and suffering, in moments where we feel like giving up. So we'll continue with the second half of our passage as it shows us some ways in which we can get through. So Peter was in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. He was bound in chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gates leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel to res and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where the people were where the people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked on the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to the door to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. But Peter kept knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion about among the soldiers as to what had happened of Peter. After Herod had the thorough search made of him and did not find him, he crossed the main guards and ordered that they be executed. So Peter is no stranger to jail. Actually, in this passage, this was the third time he had been in jail, and his only crime was that he was a Christian and that he preached the gospel. So Jesus shows us that our trials and challenges whilst we are on this earth don't have an expiry date or a time frame. There isn't a limit on just one or four. Sadly or gladly, depending on your age brackets, that doesn't determine how much you get. So we can't say, oh, you're five year old, you're gonna get five, or you're three, so only three days of suffering for you. Trials and challenges primarily come as a result of the broken world that we live in. It is a world that is so far from God's design, and so Jesus being perfect came to the world to live and die in order to restore us back to the original design. When we follow Jesus, we see his work in our lives as we leave for his kingdom to come on earth. He tells us to be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. However, this overcome will only be made complete when he returns. And until that time, we will continue to face hard times and challenges. So our attitude really must matter. How we conduct ourselves and treat our neighbors during the good times and the bad times is really a proof of the Holy Spirit that's living in our lives 
and the fact that we follow Jesus. So there's no question at all that we need the power of the Holy Spirit. In order to give life to Christians, we need the infilling of the Holy Spirit, not just once, not twice, on an everyday, regular basis. And so if you're here today and you've not yet received the Holy Spirit, I just want to encourage you to act as a prayer at the end. We would love to pray for you because the world, the road that we're walking as Christians has hard times and you're going to need that Holy Spirit's power in you to keep you strong, to keep you steady. He is the one that helps us to withstand anything that we may face. And we will get tossed and turned by the storms of life, but they will not drown us. So we need the Holy Spirit. And all the things that we, that God has given us to help us on this journey are first these angels. Many of us today do not actively believe in angels. And frankly, we find it easier to believe in the devil and demons than it is to believe in angels. But they do exist. And the psalmist tells us that God will give his angels charge over us because he cares for us. His angels will walk over us and keep us from falling. In the past year, a dear friend of mine has been battling with terminal cancer. And recently I saw her and she described moments in hospital when she was strongly aware of God's angels watching over her. And she felt this sometimes in the strong presence of the nurses, the staff, um, the visitors and other patients. And sometimes in the power of the Holy Spirit with her. And these were hopeful and life-giving moments for her. And she described a particular visit from an old dearie friend of ours who came in just the perfect dark moment of her day. And his presence and visit at that time gave her the rescue that she needed. He gave her the courage to keep holding on to Jesus. And even now she continues to hold and chooses to focus on Jesus and his continuous rescue. No matter the brokenness of the world around us or the challenges of our lives, like the disciples in the book of Acts, and like my friend, we can still have encounters with Jesus today. And we just only have to look. We have to look around us. Secondly, the church community. In Antioch, it was a community of believers that were first called Christians, not just one person. And the purpose of the trial, James' death and Peter's arrest, was not just aimed at them, but at the whole church. Its aim really was to destroy them, break their fellowship, and to scatter them. The greatest challenge to us and to the enemy is the gathered church, and it constantly seeks to scatter us and to pick us off one by one. And really, it's a really good strategy, if you ask me. Um, because one of the ways to one of the biggest ways to weaken us and to weaken ourselves as Christians is to separate ourselves from our Christian brothers and sisters. Alone, our blind spots, our blind spots are exposed, and we're weak, and we have no one to lean on. We have no one to share the struggles, and actually, we have no one to share the victories with. However, together we can face anything and have people to lean on people to pray for us, people to share those life challenges with, and people to rejoice, and people who cheer us on. And Peter had absolutely no doubt when he came out of prison and realized where he was. He had no doubt about where he would find the believers. He knew that he would find them gathered together, praying. So for anyone here today um, who's going through a really tough time, you can know that you'll find solace here, that you will find people ready and willing to pray with you, people to stand with you. And really it's a call for all of us to be mindful of people around us, people going through tough times. And we must allow ourselves to be those ones to pray also. Early prayer. You may wonder why we need to pray if trials and challenges are normal and to be accepted. But God says, act anything in my name and I will do it. Prayer is more about connecting to God than presenting him with a to-do list. However, it delights in those moments when we come before him and we pour our hearts out 
and we ask for him to do something. And he will do anything. He can do anything. Because our acting actually shows our confidence in who he is and our understanding that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. It is an understanding that we know that God is good, that he is sovereign. And this means that things in our lives, though we don't completely understand them, are all under his power and authority. We can trust and believe that he is attentive and present with us always, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. We can believe that he is fighting for us and that we can hold on to peace. We know that he, God is ultimately drawing the world to himself and he wants everyone to know him and receive his salvation. We know that he is holy and just, that he is good and kind. And we trust that because he is holy and good, then he is working all things together for our good. Jackie Hill Perry says that if God is holy, then he can sin. If God can sin, then he can sin against us. And if he can sin against us, then shouldn't that make him the most trustworthy person in the whole world? Lastly, go and tell. We have a promise that though weeping may endure for the night, and weeping does endure sometimes longer, it feels like, but we know that God's joy comes in the morning. There will be moments of joys and victories in our journey of faith, and these must be celebrated. We can't allow ourselves to dwell so much in the hard times that we forget that there are good things that God is doing in and amongst us. Because God is deserving of all of our glory and all of our praise. And so we must rejoice when we see his work, his hand at work in our lives and in the lives of those around us. We rejoice even in our gatherings, but even more importantly, what we must do is go to the world, go to those that are lost, and we testify of the God that we serve, that he is able and that he is hope and that he is able to rescue. The world around us is lost and they're blind and they're in desperate need of Jesus. Everywhere we look, we see brokenness, anxiety and depression are at an all-time high. Many have no hope and very few experience, have experienced God. And even if they have, they don't even know what they, they've experienced. Paul hacks. How can people call for help? if they don't know who to trust? And how can they know who to trust if they have not heard of the one who can be trusted? And how can they hear if no one tells them? And how is anyone going to tell them unless someone is sent? Testimony is they lift our hearts and gives us hope. And it is also this hope that this dying generation needs. And so we must go and tell and you might sit here thinking, I don't have anything good at the moment to tell anyone about. But we all have a story of God's rescue. And you don't have to wait for that big, big breakthrough to go and tell. As Christians, we have the best rescue story in the world. That is that our sin and our brokenness and our darkness did not stop Jesus from coming to the world to come and die for us. And it is this story that we have that we can go and share with others. And our vision at Emmanuel really is to see Jesus, people, to see people meet Jesus, for them to encounter God's life transforming presence, know his peace, and flourish in his purposes. And I hope that we all here today experience God's life transforming presence and that we know his peace. And that in this we can go and tell the world about him as we flourish in our purposes and in his purposes for our lives. We are all called to go. The Great Commission has sent us. So as I wrap up this morning, just a few thoughts are for us to reflect on. When we find ourselves in the middle of challenges and suffering and trials, a day like today can feel really hard. It can come across like a blow and it can even seem insensitive. And this is not my intention, and I don't think it's God's either. Over the last couple of years, I have faced some tricky times, 
and often they've come one after the other. At the beginning of this year, I saw friends and family struggle with anxiety and job security. I had surgery, a friend of mine got a terminal diagnosis. I had a place ready to buy which fell through and some relationships that broke down. And that's just the first half of the year. So there are moments of heartache and many tears for not just me, but many of us here in the room today. And I can tell you that none of those things have been resolved. So when they first asked me to do this talk, I was like, oh, I'm not sure about this. And but then I was like, okay, God, you know what? Maybe this is a good thing because by then, something would have changed and I'll be able to say, oh, I'm not at God's rescue. But actually, I can tell you that none of those things are resolved. And when I started prepping this, I felt God gently pulling me out of myself and a sense of apathy, really. And reminding me that He wanted me to teach on this so that I can see that He still cares. But also to remind you also that He still cares for you. In the midst of life challenges and trials, we can deeply fully, we can deeply rely on God's nature because he is so true to himself. It is in this truth that I felt challenged to stop looking at myself. So like me, what are you looking at? Are you looking at the things that are missing? The things that have been taken away from you? The things that maybe you think you deserve? I can promise you that there are moments in there also of God's ministry and his rescue. If only you would search for it. So, where are your angel rescue moments? So I'm just going to give us a minute um, just to think and reflect on this last month. Where have you seen God working in and around you? And if you're really struggling, ask the Holy Spirit. He can help. Finally, I want us to consider who needs to hear your rescue story today. If you've been a manual for a little while, you know that we have a simple tool that we have for sharing our stories in less than a minute. And it doesn't really have to be a monologue, but it does require practice. So the simple key is that we start with a particular moment in our lives and we share about how um, what lives look like at those times without Christ. Then we tell about how we receive Jesus' forgiveness and through his death and resurrection, we chose to follow him. We explain how meeting with Jesus has changed and transformed our lives. And then we ask them if they've ever experienced anything like this. So it's a simple tool really and we have it available. So if it's something that you're not familiar with, do ask and we can pass your across. But I imagine if you're stopping to a midweek group, we'll be able to come up again soon. We you like to go through these things because like I said, it requires practice. I love summer months, as you can see I was ready with my yellow before the rain. Because everyone is out and the days are longer and even the summer, I think, is pretty cool because we have the Euros 24, and yes, it might be coming home. <laughs> and we have the Olympics as well, which is pretty epic. Now, if anyone doesn't like the Olympics, I'm giving you a side eye. Because if you, if there's always something in the Olympics that you can enjoy. There's always something, the most random things. But if this means that there'll be loads of people around, there'll be plenty of people to meet, lots of time to hang out, at gatherings, barbecues, street parties, football watch parties, Olympic screenings, and walks in the peaks. These are people that might be in desperate, in desperate need of rescue and God's peace. And we all have a gift, we have a special gift, our story of God's rescue that we can give to them. So I encourage all of you to go and tell. We have a special chance this Wednesday when we will be having prayer meeting for you to invite some of your friends and tell 
this story. Romans 5, I think, sums all of this up really, really well. It says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we can confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope, this hope that we have will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us his Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. 